Hello, welcome to Medicine Matters Diabetes. I am Jay Schubert, DO, family physician and diabetologist, and we're continuing our series on uh, the interface between hypertension and diabetes, focusing on the new American Diabetes Association position statement on treatment of hypertension and diabetes. I'm happy to have with me today Dr. Robert Chilton, DO, who's a professor of medicine and the director of the cardiac catheterization laboratory at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas. He is also a board certified uh, physician in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, interventional uh, cardiology, and electrophysiology, and one of our nation's leaders on the interface between diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We're so glad to have you here today, Bob. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to talk a little bit about how to engage physicians and other healthcare providers into identifying and treating hypertension and diabetes. So we all know these numbers, but I, I feel often when I'm seeing my patients with diabetes overwhelmed by the number of things I have to do at one time. And at least in my practice, I have found that the blood pressure is the variable that I do least well with. So do you have any advice on how do I make sure I pay attention to hypertension and start my treatment plan? Oh, well, Jay, you are not the only one that has difficulty with these because in our three big trials, we, when we were doing the Courage, the Freedom, which is the most recent one, do you know, uh, even under the best research hands, we only got to the four variables, which are the most important ones, about 30% of people to the goal they should be at. That tells you how well we do as physicians, and that's in a research setting. Actually, I think private practice guys are far better I was in private practice, and I think we did target it. Certainly, the nurse is the key player. The other thing that most of people do not remember, but years ago, we had mercury manometers. Mm. Mercury manometers is your true reading. The current ones that you have are the ones that have the bellows in them, the little round dot that changes with humidity, believe it or not, and it's not linear. It's only an estimate. Uh, so if you say, well, I'll go to digital, that's fine. You do digital, then way we tune them up as we take a screwdriver and we kind of get them to where they look about right. Okay. So that being said, uh, at the very best, I think your blood pressures are probably sort of in the range, uh, and you probably miss it five to ten millimeters in some people. Uh, so I think that if, assuming we have good blood pressures, the way you do it is I always have the nurse take the blood pressure when they come in and miss cupping is a big deal. So if it's a rather large person, which is usually diabetes, then you're going to need a large cup. If you use a regular cup, you will make them hypertensive because it's squeezing the pressures much higher. Uh, and then I just simply take the pressure. Now, if you say, well, I'm not sure how good the person can listen with a stethoscope, which is sometimes frequent. We have, we have a lot of paramedical folks that don't do so well. You can take a systolic pulse pressure and just feel the radial artery and tell me what is that number. That's very reproducible. We use that in shock patients. We use that in the cath lab. Uh, and that number stays pretty constant. And I, if you're not sure, you can use that for your actual uh, uh, systolic pulse pressure. But all things being good, I personally still like the American manometer. Uh, that's what we have in the cath lab because I'm kind of from the back older days, and I think that's the most accurate. Uh, now, how do you get people to do it? It's mandatory, certainly in the operating room. It's mandatory in your office, just like mine is. And you just write that number down. It's probably the trend that is the most important. Sure. So I have my patient, they've got hypertension, dyslipidemia, they've got diabetes, and the blood pressure has been running 144 over 92. And, it, and I've got a trend, it's the last three visits, but it may not be the number I'm looking at first. So, you know, I, why is hypertension so important in diabetes? Why do I need to pay more attention to that number that's in my chart every time I see a patient? Yeah, uh, high blood pressure. Uh, for, I mean, historically, it is the one that went with stroke. Strokes came from high blood pressure. So uh, people don't feel it. Uh, it's just, you know, you think your pressure is just doing fine. And we have proven very clearly, even a uh, recent paper today, there's another paper coming out. High blood pressure is really key for decreasing cardiovascular events. So I always tell patients, if you want to decrease heart attacks, uh, your lipids are really important. You know, if you want to go after stroke, you 
get a look at your blood pressure. And probably the most ethnic group I have to worry about is probably the uh, African American population because they're the ones that have the higher pressures because of some of the salt changes they have. But I, I think that the uh, blood pressure measurement uh, is probably the most single most important thing you have. Uh, you know, if you think about it, I don't see many patients that have a blood pressure of 120, 110 uh, that have a lot of heart disease. Most of these people are fairly healthy. The one, once your body recognizes you've got risk factors, it seems like everything goes sideways. Your metabolics go sideways, your blood pressure goes up. These are all markers of bad outcomes in the future. So I try to target them all. But uh, Jay, just as much as you say and everyone else, if you want to decrease your cardiovascular events, you better lose weight for most of you. And it may not take a lot, but if you think back when you were in high school, what you weighed and what you weigh today, most people have put on a few pounds. Those pounds are sending out certainly chemicals that are raising your pressure throughout your body. Really important point that, you know, we, this is not just stress to the heart, this is stress to the whole body. And everyone I know, stroke is a very serious patient-centered outcome that nobody wishes for, and it is maybe a good motivator uh, for the patient as well. So one of the other things I see is that we, we see someone with hypertension, we start to treat them, but I think we treat in park. We, we don't necessarily continue to monitor, we don't continue to, to titrate. Um, any best practices you'd like to share with that? Yeah, for titration, what do I do is I use that blood pressure formula again. If you tell me you're using a diuretic, why would you add another diuretic on the same side of the equation? Uh, uh, people don't usually do this, but for example, if you're giving um, a thiazide-like diuretic and then you add a depamide to it, that's a preload. Those are both preload-reducing drugs. I think I would have added an afterload-reducing drug. At the same time, if you tell me you gave a beta blocker and then you turned around and you gave a calcium channel blocker and the pressure's not coming down, where's your preload reduction? The most important one for lowering blood pressure is preload. So go with hydrochlor uh, go with chlorothaladone first, not second. I start with that because I need to control the venous return. Let me give you a practical example. If you have a patient that's got shocky blood pressure, the very first things all of you guys do is you lift their feet up and you hang an IV and you flood them with fluid. What you're doing is you're filling the preload side or the venous return side of the heart to raise their blood pressure. Now, you want to bring the blood pressure down? Then you give a drug that knocks out preload, like nitroglycerin or Lasix or nitroprusside is both preload and afterload, but you're targeting primarily the preload side. So don't be stacking on five choices of afterload reducing drugs and not being and paying attention to the preload side. Preload's where the money is. Now, the next one that most people miss is related to actually the spironolactone or actually aldosterone circuit. The renin-angiotensin system is really powerful. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are fabulous drugs, and I like them a lot because they hit both pre- and afterload kind of evenly. That's why you don't see a heart rate jump. But if you have a patient who is actually continuing to be resistant, you might want to try spironolactone because aldosterone is a major player of the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system because, again, it's a powerful vasoconstrictor. Uh, so as you look at blood pressure, I think those are probably some of the main, key point, the, main, the main points and key areas that I would look at myself. Uh, I, you brought up a really important point. I want to make sure I have a clarification there. So it's no problem to add spironolactone to another diuretic? If you add spironolactone to another diuretic, it's not a problem, but the comment that you're headed to, I know where it's going, is potassium. So the question you ask me is, how many people raise their potassium to a high level, like the RALS trial and the emphasis trial in our heart failure? That got spironolactone and one got epilaranon. And the answer is, do you know it wasn't even hardly significant? It was probably a 0.5. Now, if you ask the private doc, that's not what they tell me. They say that they have trouble with potassium. So I would suggest for all of you, after you give these drugs, check their potassium and see what it is. I mean, if it is high, then you need to be careful with your choices. But again, as far as life-saving, it's really important. Now, spironolactone, the aldosterone blockers, there's a mineral corticoid receptor that sits on the cell wall that many people have... Uh, uh, Jim Sowers, a very good friend of mine, is an expert in this, and I, I really like this uh, receptor because it answers a lot of questions for high blood pressure. Once you block that, that receptor controls a tremendous amount of intracellular signals that 
go along with vasoconstriction. So by blocking that receptor, you not only shut that down, you also shut down the thickening and fibrosis of some of the actual vessels. Uh, in animal models, you can actually make left ventricular hypertrophy decrease. Uh, that's very helpful because it makes the heart so it relaxes more. Diabetes patients have diastolic dysfunction. That's a stiff collagen loaded ventricle of a different type of collagen. It's not very elastic. This helps it shift back towards the correct light. And it, it's not so much that you're changing the amount of uh, collagen that's building up. You're actually improving the ability of collagen to be broken down so you don't have too much of it. It's the reverse of what you would have thought, the way the body works. So I think those should be some helpful things that for the primary care doc that would help them. That's great. So I guess one last question for you is um, the guidelines talk about if you have a, a higher blood pressure reading, I believe one over 160 over 100, that you start two medications at once. Is that something you would typically do? Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah, you're exactly right. And now I'll tell you where this comes from. Many years ago, uh, my African-American physicians, just really close friends, Elijah Saunders was one of them. Unfortunately, the gentleman's passed now. But they noticed that frequently they would start two drugs at one time. And I think that may be true. And uh, I think what has happened is physicians have treated blood pressure so well, I can't think of the last time I saw a patient that actually had some of these hyperadrenergic uh, problems where they would actually have edema in their eye and go into fluid heart failure. I think it's because many of us have treated them much better. But uh, yes, I think in the, especially the African-American folks, you may want to choose two drugs at one time. And some of the combo drugs have made it much nicer. Sure. Well, I, you've really brought up some really important points today, not only about one, getting the, the technique of good blood pressure reading, two, thinking about the preload and afterload and treatment, and then three, remembering the underlying physiology when we're treating uh, hypertension and diabetes. What important points, and we thank you for sharing your practical pointers today.